Well, amen. We do need you. And so we are here proclaiming our presence, I think, helps us realize that we are in desperate need of our King. Um, man, thank you all for participating in our liturgy uh, week in and week out through video. I know that that is something new for you. And as we broadcast it to the world, um, and it just it invites all of us not just to be able to, to spectate what's going on, but also per- to participate. Um, today, as we continue on in our, um, our Easter Tide series of Take Courage, Take Heart, to be encouraged, um, we, we join kind of these first disciples again with this, um, this longing that Jesus would make good on this promise of the Holy Spirit. But there's this delay period. There's this time of waiting. There's this time of longing where he is appearing, what uh, 1 Corinthians would say, he's appearing to over 500 people in these 40 days of resurrection. And as we are waiting for the Holy Spirit to be poured out on us um, historically on the day of Pentecost at the end of May, uh, I want to talk to you this morning about what it looks like to be um, courageously generous. What does it look like for us to have a courageous generosity in the time of Corona? Um, When I think about generosity, and I know that many of you right now, when I say the words generosity, you're automatically thinking one thing, and that is your finances. That is your money. But the New Testament understanding of generosity, and in fact, the entire Bible's understanding of generosity, includes far more than what we do with our finances. Finances is the baseline. It's never the peak or the pinnacle of what it looks like to be generous. And so we'll talk a little bit more about that in just a moment. But you may ask yourself, why are we talking about generosity during corona time? And I would just ask you, um, what kind of environment causes or perpetuates um, John Krasinski to create a YouTube channel or a Facebook channel to, to, to do just some good news? What environment creates the desire for someone like that, who certainly has other things to do with their time probably, um, what, what environment creates that need? And I would say it's, it's the reality that we're in a world of bad news. We're in a world of, of hoarding. We've seen this with hand sanitizer, although I did get to find some at HEB this last week. We, we've seen this with hand sanitizer. We've seen this with some of you right now just unclicked everything and are headed to, to HEB to find hand sanitizer. I can't help you with that, but um, I have no idea how much that costs, so I can't help you. But here's the deal, right? We, we're in a, a, a world right now, in a season where, where we're hoarding, where we're not just hoarding material possessions like, like paper towels, um, like, like bread, like hand sanitizer, like toilet paper. That's, the, that's just what shows. That's just what affects everyone else. We're also hoarding our hearts, are we not? I mean, you just, just look on social media for five minutes and you'll start to see judgment. You'll start to see Christian brother against Christian brother, Christian sister against Christian sister, and, and, and on and on it goes, that, that the people that we're going to share the wedding banquet table with for all of eternity, we're turning on them because they're not doing things the way that we think they should. We're, we're judging, we're, we're, we're critical, we're, we're cynical, we're condemning of our brethren and our sistren. That's why we need to talk about generosity during corona time. Um, that's why when we look at it, it's in such stark contrast to the early church, right? What we're in right now, see, they were in a far worse situation than we were. And yet what you see in the early church in Acts 2, it describes this about the early church in Acts 2, verse 45. It would say this, and they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as they had need. Now, I can tell you this. What we're in right now, it doesn't even, it pales in comparison to the type of tribulation and trial that the early church was in. Their lives were on the line anytime they left their house, not because of a virus that they might catch and they might slowly die from or they might slowly recover from, but because of the Romans and the Jews were out to get them. And they had just seen the horrendous death of their Messiah and they knew that they might be next. You see, that was still occurring and going on in Acts 2. But something happened in Acts 2 that we'll celebrate at the end of the month, and that's the Spirit's coming to give them boldness, to give them power. But that's not the only thing that transformed their hearts, because I have to wonder, how does one transform from hopeless and fearful in the upper room to one that is then boldly proclaiming the gospel, boldly selling all they have and and, and sharing it with one another 
as they had need. What changed in all that? Yes, the resurrection appearances certainly made a difference. Yes, the Holy Spirit coming certainly made a difference. But I also wonder if in the minds of the disciples, memories kind of fueled their new life. Memories that, of, of the life that they lived with Jesus for three or four years. Those memories being the things that they cherished and that fueled them. And like, what would Jesus do in this situation? Well, remember what happened with Mary? When Mary anointed his feet and his head at Bethany, you remember that time? Man, surely that would be a memory that they would have drawn upon. It's this memory that the Steins just read for us. If you can picture it, if you will, it's basically Holy Week, and Jesus has just raised Lazarus from the dead, and he is headed into Jerusalem. And on his way, he stops in Bethany, right? And, and, and they're at this, this Simon's house, who's known for, uh, for being a, a leper. Clearly, he wasn't a leper at this time, otherwise they wouldn't be in his house. Someone that Jesus likely healed from leprosy. And you can just picture yourself in that setting, um, particularly um, as Jesus is headed to the end of his life. If you could just be there, and, and there's just a hordes of men and women, and all of a sudden, out of the shadows, you find Mary, who would normally be sitting at the feet of Jesus. You find Mary coming out of a back room with, man, you smell something, right? You smell something beautiful and good, and it's this, it's, it's Mary's treasured heirloom. It's, the, it's this uh, uh, ointment, this oil, this perfume that she brings. And as she walks through the home and she lays at Jesus' feet and she begins to just pour out her fair family heirloom on the head of Jesus, anointing him much like kings of old were anointed by, by putting oil all over him. Except this oil had, had, had a smell to it, right? This oil was, this was aromatic. And so as, as Mary brings this family heirloom, um, Judas takes note in the book of John. He says, man, this is such a waste. What a waste this is. Why would he think that? Because this ointment, this oil, uh, most people think that it was worth, in today's wage, is about $40,000. Anywhere between 30 and 50 grand, about $40,000 that Mary takes and pours out all over Jesus. This isn't something that was just expensive, right? And especially in first century Israel. This is something that Mary would have taken to Antiques Roadshow to get appraised, and we're all watching, and all of a sudden, like, it's, it's worth 40 grand at auction, and we all just go, oh my gosh, that's crazy. Am I going to save that, or I'm going to sell it? Answer is sell, always. Never going to get that kind of money again. But anyways, that's my own personal deal. That's not what Mary did. That's the Judas in me. Instead, Mary treasured Jesus, so much that she took her antique roadshow item, she poured it out on Jesus. And it's in that setting that we must enter into and kind of just waft that aroma into our souls so that we can understand what it looks like to be courageously generous during corona time and during every time. So how does this story invite us into a life of courageous generosity? I'm so glad you asked. The first thing that we need to understand, right, is that, that certainly generosity reflects what's in your heart. Must, you must have been thinking that generosity, I was going to say generosity reflects what's in your wallet or what's in your purse, but instead generosity reflects what's in your heart. So there's two New Testament concepts that I want you to understand when we think about Mary at Bethany anointing Jesus. First is that the fruit of the Spirit is kindness. And the idea behind kindness as we walk through it in Galatians 5 is that kindness really means a posture of generosity. And don't you know this in your own context and in your own experience with people, that the kindest people you know are also most likely the most generous. Um, and, and, and the stingiest people you know are also most likely the scorekeepers. The scorekeepers in relationship that kind of are always wondering if the ledger is balanced are those that are lacking generosity in their hearts. See, this isn't just about what happens in our wallet. This is about what's happening in our hearts. And that's why Jesus, not just that the fruit of the Spirit is kindness and therefore a generous posture towards one another, but also Jesus would say this in Matthew 6, 21, right? He says that where your heart is, there, where, uh, for wherever your treasure is, there your heart will also be. And so I would ask you this, what, is, what are you treasuring up in your heart? What is in your heart that you are treasuring? And you usually know what you're treasuring by how irritable you get when someone threatens it. And, and I'll, I'll give you an example from my own life. So um, 
like, like space, it's just very threatened right now. I don't know if you like, even in this warehouse, it's open and it's, and it's bigger than even in my own room, but like, there's just a part of me that like, I start to just get irritable when space starts to get encroached on me. And so right now, when there seems to be no boundary between work and life and play, man, there's just an irritability that can come at about 7, 6.30, 7 o'clock at night when my space has just been infringed upon for the last 12 hours. And I, I, I know that I need to just handle it for the next two, but I can't. See, that's what I know, that I'm treasuring up uh, peace, that I'm treasuring up space. So what is it that you treasure? See, I haven't even mentioned money yet. We're going to get to that. That's our big application point, right, is our finances, because it's an easy way to apply what we're going to do today. But this is about what's in our hearts. This is about um, really, not really about what's in our hands, but about what's in our hearts. And our hands reveal the posture of our hearts. See, do you live clenched-fisted? Do you live like this most of the day with your possessions, with the things that you treasure, with your talent, with your time, with your truth that we just repented of and confessed with one another? Because I'll tell you, if you're walking around like this, if I walked around like this, you would think I'm ready to fight not I'm ready to love. But if you walk around like this, open-handed, there's a generosity towards that. There's a benevolence to that. There's a, there's a kindness to this. So I can cling on to what I think is mine, or I can live open-handed as a posture of my open heart. You see, Mary was kind in heart. Mary was generous in spirit, and she gave all that she had to Jesus. Why? She worshiped him. Why? Why would she do this in a public setting? She could have done this in so many different ways because her treasure, and she wanted everyone to know it, her treasure was Jesus. The person and the thing that she treasured above all things, above family heirlooms, above however much money she could have made off of that, uh, even beyond doing good for the poor. And her treasure was Jesus, not her expensive ointment and certainly not what her ointment could have done for the kingdom. It was all about what was in her heart, and what was in her heart was worship. What was in her heart was generosity towards Jesus because she knew the depth of her sin. She knew that she was in great debt to the king who sat before her. She knew that she was, he was on his way to death, and she thought one last time, may I pour out all that I treasure on to him. You see, the principle from Mary is that if our hearts are dedicated to treasuring Jesus, it radically reorients how we disagree with others. Doesn't it? That when we have a difference of opinion, doesn't, if we treasure Jesus above all things, above being right, above uh, condemning another person, above critiquing another person, if we treasure Jesus above all things, won't we then be generous and gentle? It radically reorients if 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 we live like Mary did. If we live like the way Jesus did, right? Not just in disagreeing with others, but also in relating with others. Will we be people that live on grace upon grace upon grace, or will we be people that live with a scorekeeping mentality? Or how about when we bless others with our time, with our talent, with our treasure, with our truth? You hear this a lot about our 4T at the Grove. Like, how is it that we can live as a conduit of blessing, as a conduit of grace? How will we use our time, talent, treasure, and truth? The things that we treasure, truly, the talent that we have, the gifts that we have. Will we celebrate how other people are gifted or we condemn them for not doing it exactly the way that we would do it? How about um, where treasure is, where, where whatever no is the first answer to God's question, can I have for my use That's the thing that we treasure, or the truth that we have, the words that we store up, and the works that we pour out. You see, Mary reminds us that we will never be generous. We will never be the kind kind of people that God calls us to be if we do not treasure Jesus first. So we go back to this story of Mary, right? We not only see that generosity reflects what's in our heart, but we also see that generosity is never wasted. It is never wasted. Um, If you see in the scriptures, like when Mary does this, Judas says, why this waste? Why this waste? Mary takes her $40,000 worth of perfume and wastes it on Jesus. And Judas says, why is this waste? We could give it to the poor. And isn't this the question that arises in our heart from time to time? Isn't it, it's not maybe phrased that way, but maybe it's phrased this way. Is this going to be worth it? 
is my generosity going to be worth it? Like, is it going to pay off somehow? Um, do they really need it? That's one that I, that's in my heart. Like, do you really need it? Or are you just like, is this just part of the, the, the spiel? Um, or is it going to be a good return on investment? Um, those who are courageously generous don't look for something in return, however, because they realize that all they have and all they need is in Jesus himself. The generous don't hesitate with inefficiency because they realize how much of an inefficiency of God's grace that they are. So there's never this desire for a return. There's never this, or, or if there is, they work through it and they get to the point of living generously anyways. Mary's generosity, did it really make a difference? I mean, Jesus still took what she had to give and, and died, right? But there's this statement at the end of this that I want to get to that Jesus says, man, this, this thing that she did, this thing above all other things, man, this will be told wherever the pro- gospel is proclaimed. But see, if all these things are our motives of return on investment, of worthwhile, of do they really need it, if those things are in us and our motives and our questions Aren't we really more like Judas than Mary? I know I can be. I mean, w- which if we are, doesn't that really only reveal that we're not as generous as, as we want to be? We're not as generous as we could be in our hearts because we've lost sight of the grace of God. In that moment, we've lost sight of how deeply indebted we are to our king and how richly he has blessed us with every spiritual blessing, Ephesians 1 would say. See, friends, there's always going to be a reason to not be generous. There's always going to be a reason to think that I don't need to do this or that God doesn't want me to do this because after all, I'm in debt. Because after all, do they really need it? Because after all, fill in the blank. There will always be an excuse. There will always be an excuse to not forgive. There will always be an excuse to keep score. There will always be an excuse. There's always going to be something in us where we go, man, they don't deserve to have the slate wiped clean. They don't deserve to have my dollar because it could go further elsewhere. Couldn't we always find a good cause to keep us from being courageously generous? And the answer is yes. You see, Judas wanted Mary to find a worthwhile cause, and Mary's worthwhile cause was worship. It was worship. So I want to invite all of us to, to join Mary See, this is what we know, is that Jesus is saying, hey, y'all be quiet, you disciples, that you think you know everything because you've been following me for three or four years. It's just shh. And instead, what Jesus says when, he, when Mary pours all this onto him is something absolutely remarkable. She says, hey, he says, she is preparing me for my burial. And so what will Jesus do with our treasure? What will Jesus do with our time, our talent, our truth? What will Jesus do with what's in our heart if we pour it all onto him, as we demonstrate his worth in our lives? What will he do with it? He will take it. And he will carry it through the long, arduous journey through the city. And he will walk with it up that hill. And he will bear it on his back. And he will be crucified. And he will take what you give to him, and he will put it in the grave. And he will bury it, just like he was buried. Why? Because the dreams of our kids, the things that we treasure, the things that we are saving up and hoarding for, are the thing, very, sometimes, many times, the very thing that keep us from absolute surrender and living like Mary, as Jesus is king in her heart. May he be king in ours. So some are going to call this and count our courage, our generosity as courageous and some as wasteful. And what does Jesus count it as in verse 10? What does he say? Why do you trouble this woman? For she has done a beautiful thing. I want you to just, I want you to just catch that because the God of the universe who created rainbows and he created lions and snow leopards, which are some of the most beautiful creatures that I could think of, who created Yosemite, He says, this is a beautiful thing. We pour out all that we treasure onto Jesus. What will happen if we live like this? You see, this is where the end of the story, and it starts to capture my imagination, and I pray it captures yours. 
Look at what Jesus says right here in verse 13 about Mary. Something he doesn't say about just anything. This is a special statement now. Not just that this is beautiful, but then he promises this thing about Mary. Truly I say to you, whatever or wherever this gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. What a phenomenal statement that Jesus makes right here because he's going to invite us to realize that this kind of generosity, this kind of courageous generosity where one would pour out everything that they treasure onto Jesus because he is being anointed as king over our lives, that's the thing that will be shared amongst all the world when the gospel is proclaimed. This generosity is contagious like a wildfire. How is this so? And I want you to follow me here now. Jesus says Mary is preparing him for his burial, and in days, Jesus will be paraded through Jerusalem, and he will still smell like Mary's perfume. As he passes the masses, as he is raised above the earth, which he created, he will not look like a king of all things, but he will smell like one. Can you see this? And now I want you to look at this other scripture. You've got that picture in your mind, and I want you to look at what Paul says about us as believers. Think of now Mary, who now are us. He says this in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14. Jesus being paraded through the city as if um, the enemy is somehow parading him through. You see, before I read this, here's what I want you to see. In ancient times, when a king would go and, and capture and conquer a new nation, what he would do is that he would bring back the main leaders of that nation and he would parade them through the city as if to say, I conquered that nation and here are the leaders. And so he would lead these, this, this train of captives through the city, through the main parts of the square, as if to say, I am now king and reign, and reign over all these subjects. And so the city would know and they would see and they would trust that this, this new king that they have has conquered all this. And Jesus was paraded through Jerusalem as if to think that the enemy was parading and, and saying, man, I have conquered Jesus. But that's not at all what happened, right? We know that through the scriptures that, that Jesus made a public spectacle of all those authorities. He triumphed over them over the cross. And even in so doing, he now says this about us. He has conquered us. He has brought us in as the spoils of victory over the enemy. Right? He's now bringing us through the city in 2 Corinthians 2. I want you to see this now, verse 14. But thanks be to God who in Christ always leads us in triumphal procession. See, we were in active rebellion against him in this other nation of, of being led by our, uh, our master of sin and of the devil, and now we have been conquered, brought in through love, set free through love, that now we're living in the kingdom with a new king, and, and Jesus, our king, is always leading us through triumphal procession to show everyone else throughout all the cosmic universe, angels and demons and the enemy and everyone looking on to say, we are his treasure. We are his treasure that he went to a foreign land and conquered and now we serve him, submit to him and love him. Keep walking, verse 14, and, spread, and through us spreads the fragrance of the knowledge of him everywhere. You starting to get the connection? You starting to get the connection to Mary that now how is it that Mary's uh, generosity will be proclaimed throughout all the nations, it's by us. It's by our generosity. It's by our courageousness to follow Jesus. And as we continue to walk in verse 15, for we are the aroma of Christ. We are now that perfume. We are now that nard, as John says. We are it. We are the aroma of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing, to one, a fragrance from death to death. You see it? You can't live smelling like Jesus and everybody enjoys it, just like every perfume that you ever tried to avoid in Macy's or Dillard's, right? Just, just, you, 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 it's not going to be an all-pleasing aroma. We're gonna, we can't avoid rejection and follow Jesus. No, instead that we are this pleasing aroma from, for some to death. And for others, the fragrance from life to life that we would be reminders of one another that this is the life that is truly life. Who is sufficient for these things? God. 
Look, Mary poured out her treasure on Jesus, and her generosity was an aroma of worship, of giving. All that we have to go be buried with Christ so that he could show others that we have no life except that which he raises in us. See, when we talk about courageous generosity, we're not just talking about what's in our wallet. We're talking about what's in our heart. So what is it that you are, are holding back from Jesus? What is it that when you think about generosity, you go, everything but that, that's what God wants. That's what God wants us to bring to him. And many times, you know what? Many times it is our finances. Many times it is the things that we, like the fruit of our labor, um, whether it be our kids or whether it be our house or our cars or our money, just straight cold, hard cash. And so to help us understand how it is that we can, we can do this together, to help us understand, like, how do we live with courageous and generous hearts? How do we use our jobs? How do we use our free time, our money, and our desires as courageous acts of generosity? Um, we have invited another roundtable, our second here, where we've invited two partners uh, to, to kind of come and join in on this discussion together. And as we get ready for them to come, um, I'm going to move out of the way, and they're going to get going here. But look, we've got two partners that come are going to come and, uh, and join us for this discussion. Um, one of them being one of our elders is Josue Sanchez, and another partner of our church is Troy Wooten. And as we get situated, um, let me just uh, introduce these guys uh, so that we can all have an understanding. Make sure you turn your mic on. We'll be good to go. Um, great. Perfect. So um, with me today are two of our partners. Hey, look at that. It's like we just magically appeared and it worked. Um, so we got two guys uh, with us this morning. So Josue is uh, just next to me. He is one of our elders, pastors, and uh, he's certainly the elder over our finances. He's also a small business owner. And then Troy Wooten across the table, who is a financial advisor with Edward Jones, but he's also a partner of The Grove and has been from like very early on. And so um, and we're grateful that both of you guys are here. So thanks for joining us here in the warehouse, <laughs> um, in Josue's warehouse. And so that's a, a good thing. And so, and Bo, and of course, uh, Joe Scanlon. So we're really grateful for their generosity this morning to be able to have us in here. Um, so I want to do a couple different things. I do want to talk about our finances. I also want to join um, and, and just kind of finish up with generosity here at the end. But Troy, I want to start with you. Um, you are a financial advisor, again, with Edward Jones out in the Fulcher area. What's like number one thing you wish people knew before they came and saw you or, or maybe the one thing that they did before they came and saw you? Yeah, so that's a great question. Uh, one of the things I wish people knew was not to be intimidated or scared when it comes to money. Uh, I feel sometimes when I talk to people, there's a lot of shame in not knowing what's going on or not having a picture or we're so worried about keeping up with other people. Uh, so I, w I would like for people to, s to get that out of their mind Come with an open mind, ask questions. Uh, you don't know what you don't know. I don't expect you to be an expert. That's why we ask for help. I'm yeah. not a doctor. I could easily go to WebMD, but I would rather go to an expert. So that's one thing. Just don't be intimidated. Yeah. So it's <clears throat> it, our intimidation many times silences us or keeps us paralyzed. And what you're, I hear you saying is maybe own it and be okay with the fact that we don't know all the things and go to the people that do. Or Absolutely. at least they have dedicated their lives to it, right? Absolutely. So um, we are all in this weird season. We're getting money and checks from the government. Um, and I just want to, like, take a little bit of a time out in this just to maybe answer a couple of basic questions about that. There's some confusion about it. There's, it's hard to figure out what's fact and fiction during corona time about toilet paper, much less about what this uh, stimulus uh, check is for. Is this a, an advance on 2021's tax returns? Like, let's just get some just basic things out of the way. Right. So that is one of the number one questions I get a lot of, is this going to take away from my tax return next year for those that get that? And so the answer is no, it does not. Uh, it's an advance on a tax credit that you'll get in 21 for 20 that would not have been there. So if you're used to getting tax returns and things like that, you're still going to get it. So you're not going to owe automatically 1200 bucks next year. You for will your, not. Or whatever it may be. Yeah. Okay. Poor so, wording on their part, but you will not. Poor wording on their yeah. part. The government? That's weird. Yeah, shocking. That's, yeah, fancy. Um, all right. So, okay. So I, I, as a financial advisor then, like uh, beyond the facts about what the stimulus is, there's some thought um, amongst Christians that like, I don't want this money. I don't need this money. Can they return it? What can they do if they don't want it or they don't need it? What are your thoughts on that? 
Right, absolutely. So we, we're, this is something I'm seeing a lot. Uh, the amount of money that you can get in some of the, our income levels, they don't, we don't need it. So I would encourage people to be generous with it. I would uh, focus on taking care of your family, you know, extended family, maybe not your personal one, your friends. Uh, if you have businesses that support our community, maybe looking into that. Uh, but the biggest thing I would say is we live in a pretty great country. We have some of these safety nets, if you will, that a lot of other countries don't. So I would strongly consider, if you don't need it, giving to missions abroad because they're affected just like us and they're not getting these checks. So I, would, I, I think if you really don't need it, that's where I would focus my money at. Yeah, so just as a plug for all of us that call the Grove home. Um, so the Rose are home from Thailand during Corona time. Um, they're off the mission field right now. I don't know what their financial needs are. Uh, the Smiths are back from Zimbabwe, what looks like uh, indefinitely, and we don't know what they're gonna be doing next. But um, our, our partners in South Asia are still uh, rolling strong. And um, if you know anything about that area, if you've been there or maybe you've heard us talk about it, um, what you'll know is that they are going to encounter a food shortage soon if they're not already. They are locked in their villages. They're not allowed to go outside. Um, the freedoms that we have where there are main suggestions here are, um, are not suggestions there. And so um, if you want to give a financial gift to our partners there, um, you can comment here. We'll make sure that, you, that we get it to the right spot and we get it to where it needs to be. Um, that's one of the things that we're purposing to do through this time as the church. We are sitting down, just like Troy was saying, sitting down and, and thinking about how can we bless our local partners like Depelchin and Attack Poverty and places like that, which we already have. Like the good news is, is that your generosity has already flowed out to them in the thousands of dollars to both Depelchin and to Attack Poverty. Um, but we hope to um, be able to understand the needs also in our partnership with South Asia, uh, South Asia? South Asia and be able to give there as well. And so we're looking at how we can best uh, make our impact there as well in the, in the days to come. So, okay, so you're saying if you don't need it, maybe just, man, just like use it to bless other people. You don't have to give it back to the government. They're not asking for that, but use that to bless your local businesses, uh, be an instrument of, of renewal where you live. Um, okay, that's great. So if we do need it, what would be some priorities that you would suggest for us? Yeah, absolutely. So priorities, obviously, one, taking care of your family, making sure we're paying our bills, we have homes to live in, we have food, uh, we have those things that help us get by with everyday life. That would be priority number one. I would say do not go out and buy a flat screen TV right now. That was, that's, don't, no, don't do that. Uh, but focus on your family. And if your immediate family's needs are taken, you know, it's good to extend it one, your parents, grandparents, your brother, your sister, you know, times are tough. Not everyone's situation's the same. So we want to make sure that we are taking care of our families, extended, and making sure we can all get through this together. Yeah. And I would add to that, I know that I didn't, I'm answering my own question a little bit here, but like also our spiritual family, um, that there may be some needs in our groups, our neighborhood groups, our growth groups that people aren't comfortable sharing, um, uh, you know, abroad or with everybody. And so um, they are more comfortable sharing in a smaller group. Um, that maybe your family doesn't need it, and maybe it's a good opportunity just to, to bless with generosity. Um, maybe they won't ever ask for help, but they just go, yeah, I, I, I lost my job last week or whatever, and you just take that as your little note uh, to be able to help them and bless them in such a way. Um, all right, so now to both of you. Do you guys see, I'm, I'm, I'm really, I'm, I'm tapping you as elder and pastor, but I'm also tapping you as advisor. Um, do you guys hear or see any ethical dilemma in Christians receiving this money from the government? Am I on? Yeah. So I'd say um, I don't see any scriptural um, <clears throat> evidence for uh, not taking the money or that this is sinful to do that. And so where scripture is not black and white on a topic, I think, you know, speaking of generosity, I think we can be very generous with the way we approach the topic. And so if my brother or my sister disagrees with the way I view this, and I think we can be generous with that. I think the landing question for us um, and what we're talking about is, can we ultimately glorify God by receiving it and taking it and doing something with it um, or by saying, I'd rather not take it? Um, and so I think, I think that's the landing question here where scripture's somewhat ambiguous or silent on a topic. We can be generous with our brothers and sisters and, uh, and can we land on, all right, so how will I glorify God through this money? 
Did you add anything to that? Yeah, I just echo pretty much what Josue said. Uh, I, I get it, right? We have this conversations with people. I get both sides to this, and just kind of like we discussed earlier this week, what do what honors God most? Yeah. And just I think that's will help you guide your way. Yeah. What honors God most? Yeah. And I think that's a good transition into probably this next thing that I'm going to ask you, Josue, is um, how would you counsel someone to use this money to invest in the kingdom? Like, not, And I use the word investment not as like a return on investment, but as truly this isn't just a gift that we're giving away. We're going to see it be multiplied by the Lord. And so that's why I think of investment. What would you say and counsel someone that is looking like, okay, my family's taken care of, and maybe not in this order. Like these aren't Dave Ramsey baby steps where you have to go in order. But like family's taken care of, I've, I've tried to bless a neighbor. Um, how can this be then used for the kingdom? And what would you kind of share with them um, on how to do that? Sure. So I think that um, approaching this question kind of starts off with a, just a very baseline tool that uh, many of us oftentimes don't use as Christians or believers for our finances. And uh, I was talking to my wife about this last night, and I'm like, what do you think that tool is? And she goes, I don't know, a spreadsheet? I'm like, you know I'm going to say yes to that, but no, that's not the primary tool uh, for this. I think the primary tool as believers is prayer. And so I think our starting point has to be coming before the Lord and saying, Lord, what would you have me do with this? Because I think if we limit it to the stimulus check, then even in that, I think we're setting boundaries and parameters where we're saying, God, there, you can only get up to this point. And beyond that, it's, it's up to me. And, and so I think uh, starting off with prayer, being sensitive to the spirit, keeping open ears and open eyes to needs around us, um, and then being very um, okay with not knowing where that's going to end up. Because I think that uh, our culture values a lot of success and seeing product or producing from our, our labor and our investment. But I think that when it comes to the kingdom, uh, we don't know how far what we give will go, whether it's our money or our time or a word. And so I'd say just be mindful of the spirit. Be mindful of the people around you. Be mindful of of yourself and your family, of course, um, and then just obey. Whatever God puts in your heart, get on your knees and pray, and God gives you a few names. Write them down and, and give it out. And, and, and I would just say one other thing uh, out of that is uh, think big and think out of the box. Uh, maybe you take some of this, and there are people around you that don't necessarily have a need, but you send them a meal just to say, hey, I'm thinking about you. just wanted to show you the love of Christ. And I think that's just an easy win for us to share uh, of the abundance God's given us. So don't limit it to the stimulus check. Pray about it and, uh, and then just obey. Yeah, I love that you just said that. Don't limit it to the stimulus check um, because I think, you know, for the first time, many of us are going, oh, I have this extra money. What do I do? I think if we, like, lived on a budget, and Troy, like, you probably would agree with this, I think, but, like, we all need to be on a budget, whether we're in excess or we're in need because we, I, for me, it helps me understand not only where I'm spending but also where I'm wasting um, on myself uh, or whatever, and also where I can be more generous. Um, and so this is like not just stimulus check. This is every day, every month for the rest of our lives trying to understand. And again, we never graduate from the basics, right? We never graduate from reading and prayer um, and just getting with the Lord and asking him, what do you want me to do with my day, with time? What do you want to do with my life, my vocation? Um, which kind of leads us, I think, into this next conversation, not necessarily about finances, but also about what we do with the, not even excess, but with what God's given us with time. Troy, you have served um, in the nursery. You have served in the parking lot. You have served as a neighborhood group host, um, amongst other things. Um, and now you're serving here this morning in the warehouse. Um, as you've served, like what, I, I think that takes a posture of generosity. Um, how does that factor into your decision to serve and do those things? Because you could be doing a lot of different other things with your life. You, you, you also help organize the, the walk for Alzheimer's and all those other things that are outside of the Grove. Why do you do those things, and what are the things that kind of push you towards that? Yeah, so I'm reminded of a, uh, a great quote, and it goes like this. It says, uh, we make a living by what we get, but we make a life by what we give. And one of the things, I mean, money, that's easy to give, right? But some of the rarest forms of generosity you could have are time and attention, yeah. especially to others. And for, for me, it's, whether it's be Depelchin, spending time with the children, 
listening to them, empathizing them, understanding their stories. Same, using the walk for Alzheimer's, same kind of thing, being an advocate for somebody. You would be surprised how long, how long, it, go, how long away it goes for just listening to somebody and yeah. hearing their story and talking to them about yeah. it. Yeah, I didn't mean to um, forget about the, all the times we've gone to DePelch and like just you and me in that gym for yep. so many days. And the things that we've seen in that place and broken up. Oh, man, gosh, so good. Um, but generosity certainly helps us tell those stories of what the Lord uh, provides for us a- along the way. Um, so you don't have to do those things. You do them. I think for you, Josue, a lot of people look at the position of elder or pastor and they go, oh, well, you have to live generously. You're an, you're an elder. And most people don't realize, like, you're an elder because you live generously. You don't live generously because you have to. You, you, you get to serve in the position of elder or pastor because you have a track record of a lot of different things that the, the Bible talks about, but certainly generosity being one of them. So you're newly married, under a year. You're a small business owner. Um, you are looking for a house right now. I think you were doing that yesterday. Probably we'll do some more this afternoon, um, unless you're Sabbathing or something. Um, you have a lot of reasons to hoard and to save. Maybe it's not hoard. Maybe it's just save. You have a lot of reasons to um, use your resources for your own purposes, and yet you continue to look. You're not just saying these things. You've practiced these things. I know that. What drives you to do that? It's not because you have to. So what is it for you that drives those things? Yeah, so I, I'd start by saying I'm not, like, graduated, and I'm, like, killing it. I'm just doing everything so well. Um, I still, and my wife and I still have to, uh, fight the temptation of, well, how much do we save? How much is enough? How much more do we need? Um, how much more do we plan for the future? And so I don't, I don't think we ever, uh, especially in our context here in the United States, we don't ever graduate from that. I think, though, what helps us work through that and fight against uh, the temptations of wanting a little bit more is uh, looking back and seeing God's faithfulness. And so I can look back through my story and see times of great um, financial need and physical need, and he was just faithful through that time. Yeah. And even in that time, he's allowed me to be a blessing, maybe not through finances at that point, but through the ta- talent he's, he gave me, talents he's given me to be able to serve others. And, uh, and then I've also been able to see a time of abundance where God's just provided so much. And it's been interesting in that time, um, it's easy, especially when right out of college, I was had a good job, steady job, good pay, was in my 20s, paid off all my student loans, and I thought, man, I have all this cash I could, you know, buy stuff with. And uh, I had a conversation with you, very simple conversation that you asked me, so do, do you tithe before or after taxes? I was like, I've never thought about that. Like, that's just, I don't, I've just tithed my entire life. And what that, uh, the domino effect that question had for me was one of, realizing I didn't really pray much about my finances at that point. It was just kind of on autopilot. And so I just thought, well, I'm being faithful. I'm giving 10%. I was taught. I grew up thinking um, 10% is the Lord's. The other 90% is yours to do whatever you want with it, right? And then began to go to Scripture and read, oh, what does it mean to be a disciple? What does it mean to serve God in all of life? And realized uh, quickly that I'm a steward of what he's given me, not the owner. And so I don't... Um, the same way that in the company I was with, uh, I had a yearly budget and they would ask me to manage it. I never went and spent it however I wanted to because I knew I had an obligation responsibility to that company. And, but I also knew that I could basically do anything I wanted in that company when it came to projects because the pockets were so deep of that company. Well, I look at my life as a disciple, as a son of God, and think, man, he is the owner of everything in the world and provides for everything. I'm simply a steward, and I get to serve him through the way that I steward my finances. And so I think I look back, I see him be faithful through that, and I think what that's produced in me has been um, gratitude. And so living in light of all the love he's given me, uh, in Matthew 10, he tells the he sends the disciples out, and he says uh, to cast out demons, to heal the sick, to raise the debt. And then he says, uh, freely you receive, freely you should give. And so I, I wonder what it would look like if we really take that seriously as disciples, that uh, it's not ours, that we're simply stewards. And so we are to come before the Lord. And it's probably something we should do more frequently than we, we probably normally do. Because uh, I think once we have a budget and we kind of set it on cruise control, we kind of forget about it. But this is a yearly question and sometimes quarterly question I'm asking, Lord, what do you want me to do with this? Um, and it's like any other spiritual muscle. The more you exercise it, I think the more you grow in it. And so, you know, I, 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 don't, I wouldn't say just 
be reckless. I think there's a responsibility we have to provide for our families and our loved ones. But I think uh, seeing and trusting the God of the universe and his faithfulness, living in light of, of being uh, grateful for all he's done for us. And then uh, I think all that in us ultimately helps us uh, trust a God that's going to provide a pathway forward. Yeah. So I think that's, that's yeah. where I land. So the God of the universe calls our generosity that when we treasure him above all things, beautiful. That's what it says in the scripture that we talked about today. Uh, I mean, I just want to, we, we could talk about this for another hour or two. Uh, we're going to spare everyone of that pain and horror. Uh, we're going to wrap up. But man, I appreciate Troy, you being here. appreciate Josue, you guys both giving your insights from different perspectives, small business owners, um, like elder, just leader of, of family and community. Just appreciate you guys. Uh, being able to sit down in the round table here and, and help us apply the scriptures of generosity. Um, I want to close by doing this. Um, if this conversation has been unsettling to you, if this conversation has been something that you've kind of quivered at and you've thought, man, and of course the church is then now talking about generosity again. Now I want to encourage you to remember um, like how much, there's this story, um, it's a similar story uh, when Jesus went into, again, Simon's place uh, in Luke 4, I believe, or maybe it's 6, somewhere in, in the early parts of Luke, and Jesus tells a story to Simon about a woman who, who anoints his feet with oil. And he says, look, like, who do you think is going to love more? Who's going to love more generously? The one that, that has a little bit of sin forgiven or the one that has been forgiven much? And Simon says, it's the one that's been forgiven much. I want to invite us to remember that we have been forgiven much. We are deeply in debt to the Lord, and he does not hold that over us. He's not stingy. He's not a scorekeeper. Instead, he's wiped clean the score of our lives through his son, Jesus. And the Bible says that for our sake, though he was rich, he became poor so that we may have the abundant riches of God in Christ Jesus. I want us to be reminded of that as we go out of here today, as you go about your day, um, that man, God has given to you abundantly more than you could ever have asked or imagined. And I just wonder what it would look like. I join Josue and Troy. I wonder of wondering and imagining what it would look like for a small little community like the Grove to start living generously with one another and with the world around us with whatever God has given us, time, talent, treasure, and truth for God's glory and our own good. So with that, let me speak a word of blessing over us. Let me first close us in prayer and ask the Lord for help as the Holy Spirit empowers us to do this throughout the week. Lord, help us, Holy Spirit. Encourage us and speak to us. May we be people of prayer and on our knees so that we may get up and live with generous hearts and hands towards those around us, towards those online, and towards those that you will surprise us with this week, that disagree with us, that are um, offensive to us, or maybe that just have a need. And we wonder, we're going to have this question. Do they really need it? Should I really do this? And most likely the answer is yes. And so would you help us be bold, courageous, and generous as we leave here today? We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, we're going to end today like we've ended the last several weeks, both in Lent and in Eastertide with John 16, 33. And so let me speak this as a word of blessing over you. That Jesus said a lot of things, but he said these things to prepare his disciples for his death. And he said this, I have said these things to you in order that you may have peace, shalom, because in the world you will have trouble. You will have tribulation, but take heart, be encouraged, for I have overcome the world, says Jesus. Now let's take that peace Let's take the assurance of Jesus' victory over the world into our neighborhood, into our networks, and into the nations for the glory of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Be blessed and amen. We'll see you soon.